Have you ever had anybody come up to you like that? <laughs> I'm Larry Smith. I'm the principal at Indian Springs Elementary School, and I am a minister, believe it or not. If you're sitting in the first five to ten rows, you're in the Shamu zone. If you know what that is, that's a splash zone, so I will splash on you. So if you want to move back, you can. I'm teasing you. <clears throat> Greg uh, called me about a month ago, and he said, uh, can you preach on the 26th? And the next words out of my mouth were, are you sure you want me to preach? He goes, yeah. I said, Greg, you don't know what's going to come out of my mouth. He said, we'll have a disclaimer. <laughs> so uh, some stuff probably will come out of my mouth, but uh, I'm just being who I am. So uh, if I offend you, come up and whack me like my mother always does. So I'm uh, going to talk to you today about evangelism and sharing your faith. And uh, when I say the word evan evangelism, what pops in your mind? Back when I was younger, what popped in my mind was televangelists. I remember one that I really liked, Will Roberts. He was an awesome televangelist, uh, but he uh, would have you send money to him and buy his prayer cloths and all kinds of things. I did see another type of televangelist the other day in Broken Arrow, on 71st and Lynn Lane, in a three-piece suit on the corner, screaming at cars as they drove by. How many have seen evangelists like that? Is that effective? Maybe. But maybe not. When uh, you look in the Bible... It talks about evangelism in Matthew. It says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. Evangelism is your mission in life. And I think the big problem with evangelism is the word. Evangelism. Sounds real churchy, doesn't it? Evangelism is you sharing your life with people you know. That's it. Just sharing your life with people you know. In a group this big, there are people that you know that I will never know. So who's responsible for sharing Jesus with those people? You are. Tony Holmes knows people, Lord, he knows people, that I will never know. That's Tony's business. And I know lots of people, and that's my business. Fill in this blank. Evangelism is blank's responsibility. It's in your bulletin. So I'm at principal, so you better get your pen out, <clears throat> fill in the blank if I see you not doing that. Don't say you're just an oral learner and you're going to absorb it. Okay, you've got to write it down. So, I hope none of you put this name in there unless this is your name. I hope none of you put Greg Pittman in that blank. Bless his little head. He's in Africa as we speak. Is it Greg's responsibility? Sure it is for his circle of people. But the name that should be in that blank is your name. It's your responsibility. And I bet you're saying, well, I didn't go to Bible college. I don't know the scripture. You probably didn't say it like that. But it is your responsibility to share your faith with those around you. Here's the common misconception about evangelism and sharing your faith. You have to be someone you're not in order to be effective. Okay? Do you think that I could be someone I'm not? No. My mother told my wife after we'd been married about, oh gosh, 20-some years, she said, you know, Robin, 
He's your problem now. You've had him longer than I've had him. Okay? So you're not going to change that much in who you are. You're just not. So you can't use that excuse to not share your faith with other people. But I'm going to show you six things or six types of things that you can do to share your faith. And I will tell you that some of you can't do some of these things. You're just not made that way. Okay? But there are some things that you will go away with today to share your faith with your friends. And it doesn't involve a Bible track or holding your Bible in your hand and whacking it on their head. It doesn't. It'll just be involved being who you are and what they need. Does that make sense? So, let's look at my bald spot as I walk toward the screen. <clears throat> you can share your faith without changing who you are. You do it every day. You share who you are every day. That can be a good thing, and that can be a bad thing. Remember, there's a scripture in the Bible that talks about whether you're hot or cold and you're lukewarm. God didn't say he would spit you out if you're hot and cold. When did he say he'd spit you out? when you're lukewarm. Because if you're hot for him, he's got you. If you're cold for him, he knows you're that way. But if you're lukewarm, the people you interact with, they see that. Do you know that? You're not fooling anybody. So, God uses every one of you in here as a minister. Okay? So when you leave this place today, you're not going to be on staff, <laughs> but you're going to be, I want you to be more cognizant of how you can minister to those people that you touch every day. Okay? Let's look at the first one. The first one is a confrontational style, and <clears throat> the person that reminds me of the Bible about this person is, the, is Peter. Peter kind of was the guy who said, ready, fire, aim. He was that kind of guy. He said, he opened his mouth before he thought some of the time. He was, he had passion. It says in the Bible, in Matthew 16, 15, when Jesus asked the disciples who they thought he was, Peter declared that Jesus was the Messiah. Then a few later, uh, verses later, he challenged Jesus on his stated mission. He knew who Christ was. But sometimes he said things that he shouldn't have said. He opened his mouth before he thought. Can you imagine trying to correct the Son of God? Okay, I'm going to say something that might offend you. You ready? In Broken Arrow, you can get a rock in your hand, and you can close your eyes, and you can spin around three times and throw the rock, and guess what you're going to hit? a church, right? Why is that? Because there are people who have different views about what the Bible says, right? How many of you here have been a Baptist before? Oh, I thought you'd be sitting on the back row. <clears throat> oh, I see you back there. How, any Methodist? You said Methodist? Did you bring your covered dish? Lord knows we don't have any Catholics in here, do we? There we go. I knew we did. Very good. Just think of the power and the impact we could make in this community if we all got on the same page. Amen? We could do some great things in this community for God if we got together. Peter was direct. He was bold, and he was right to the point. In the first service, 
Randy Beeson was sitting right here. How many know Randy Beeson? Okay. Randy is a dork, okay? I, told, I, I said it in the first service. Randy knows I said it. The first time I met Randy, oh, Lord of mercy. Guess what he talked about? The Civil War, okay? Civil War. And he kept talking about it. And uh, I started looking through him. And uh, I, thought, I thought Randy was a dork. I really did. Until one day, Greg asked him to preach at Cedar Ridge over in the other building. How many have been going to Cedar Ridge since we were, when we were over at the other building? Okay. Randy preached one Sunday, and I just happened to be leading worship. And he gets almost through with his sermon, and he has a sword. You remember this? And he takes the sword and he crosses it on the stage and he challenges people in their faith. And over a hundred people came forward that Sunday. And so, and I was one of them because I was convicted. So later that day, Greg calls me, Greg and our buddies, and he calls me and he goes, well, how did the service go? I said, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. He said, what happened? I said, over 100 people came forward at the invitation. He said, no, really? Because <laughs> he knew Randy was preaching. He said, how many came forward? I said, 100 people, over 100 people. And I told him the story. And he was shocked. But you know why 100 people came forward? Because Randy was bold. And Randy says it like it is. And Randy's going to tell you. And looking out amongst you this morning, and I'm one of them, I don't have that gift. I have it with some things. Just ask my daughter. But I don't have it with talking about Jesus like that, the way Randy did. It was unbelievable. So Randy's confrontational. And, many, and some of you in here are the same way. And that's a good thing. But you need to be careful if you're that way. You need to mix grace with truth. Does that make sense? I'm going to say that a lot because I do that a lot with my teachers. Am I making sense? So, The second one is the intellectual style. Intellectual. Don't ask me how to spell it. Just figure it out. And I know what you're thinking. Larry, this isn't yours. <laughs> this isn't your gift. This isn't the way you do it. And you're right, it isn't. The Apostle Paul was like this. He was logical, and he knew the gospel message. I told the people at Woodland Terrace, I said, you know, the cool thing about the Apostle Paul was that he killed Christians when he was Saul. And then he met Christ on the road to Damascus and became who? Paul. And then he was a preacher. Can you imagine being ministered to by Paul, who was a Christian killer? That would not be very comforting. But you know the cool thing about Paul? He was a very well-studied man. And some of you in here are like that. You actually read your Bible. You read your Bible and you try to understand your Bible. And you have the gift of sharing with people and arguing with people about what it means to be a Christian. Because there are people in the world who need that. They, don't, they will not take, well, you just have to accept it on faith. There's people in the world that won't, they don't buy that. They want to know, point by point in the Scripture, what Christianity is all about. That's the Apostle Paul. And I bet there are people in your life that need that type of minister. Confrontational? Yes. Defined and defending the gospel. The third type is the testimonial type. And the person I want to bring you to is in John chapter 9, and it's the blind man. Well, 
I know some blind guys, okay? But this guy had been blind for a long time, and he sat out in front of the temple, and people passed him all the time. They knew this guy, that he was blind. You know, I'm sure when he got up, he just didn't walk normally. I mean, he probably had to have someone guiding him, or he bumped into the walls a lot or, or something like that. They knew this guy was blind. But what happened to this blind guy? He was healed. He could see. And he was changed. He became a different guy. And people saw and recognized him as a different person. And he had a testimony. Anybody heard of T.D. Jakes? I've got a testimony. And he'd wipe his brow. Testimony is a churchy word, but it means your story. Your story. Now, my story is not that bad. You know, I didn't do drugs, and I wasn't a recovering alcoholic, and, you know, I didn't kill people, and, you know, I just grew up in a church and listened to ladies tell me about Jesus. My story is not that important. <laughs> All your stories are important. What's your story? Have you ever thought about your story? Yes, no? Have you ever shared your story? Maybe your story's a bad story. Saturday, <clears throat> believe it or not, I'm a marathoner. I run marathons. Then my body looks sleek. <laughs> Don't look at this side. I've run three marathons. And uh, I'm coaching a half marathon team for Runner's World, and I have 60, about 60 women on this, uh, this team, and uh, a couple of guys. And this one guy I was talking to on Saturday, he was telling this story. He was a, he's a marshal and works for the marshal service. And he was sharing this story about this other runner that was in this group, this real skinny guy. Just looked like a zipper. And uh, he said, uh, you know what that guy does for a living? I go, no, what's he do? He goes, he's a, he's a U.S. attorney. I said, really? He said, he used to weigh 400 pounds. He said, he used to be this big. And I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, I hadn't seen him for the longest time. And he said, I saw this guy that looked just like him. And I said, uh, I, I introduced myself to him, and I said, uh, do you have a brother who's an attorney? And he goes, I am that brother. He had changed. He, had lost, he went from 400 pounds to like 150 pounds. Have you ever seen anybody that's been like that? They stand out. They, they're, um, it's amazing, the change. And that's the way they were, was with the blind guy. It was such a miraculous change in his testimony. He could share that Christ had touched him. Has Christ touched you? Yes or no? Raise your hand if Christ has touched you. Okay, put your hands down. Raise your hand if Christ has touched you hard. Almost knocked you over. You have a testimony. All of you do. Here's a, one caution with that testimony. Be a good listener when you share your testimony. My mom always told me, you have two ears and one mouth because you need to listen twice as much as you talk. I don't know why she told me that, but she told me that. <laughs> Right, Kim? <laughs> Kim's known me a long time. I talk way too much. But when you're sharing your testimony, whatever it is, be a good listener of what that person needs. Does that make sense? See, I said it again. 
be a good listener of what you need to share and when to shut up. Okay? You need them, you need to give them time to process what you're sharing with them. It says in John 9.25, One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. And in verse 3 it says, Jesus said, This man had been born blind so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. If God is working in you, he's doing it for a reason so you can be a display. Make sense? Look at this. I'm passing notes. I'm doing sermon notes. They're going to the side. I just took off three pages. Isn't that awesome? Greg never does that. Make sure you tell him that next Sunday. The next style is the relationship style. And in Scripture, the person that comes to mind there is Matthew, the tax collector, who always, you know, invited his friends in to have banquets and just have a good time with Matthew. Matthew was a follower of Jesus, believe it or not. Tax collector, follower of Jesus. And he had a lot of friends. Do you have a lot of friends? Are you good at inviting people to go do things? Maybe you're not. Maybe you're married to one. But some of you in here have a gift of being... Uh, social. You think I have that gift? Yeah, I do. I do. You're the kind of person who invites people. You like to spend time with people. And you like to share with people. Now, that's not talking about Jesus when you bring him over. This isn't an Amway presentation. Okay? Don't do that to people. Don't invite them to some place, and then, and if you've sold Amway, I, I apologize, okay? Uh, I just know how a guy did it, worked with me. He invited me over to his house, and then he started selling me stuff, and that was kind of, yeah, I didn't like that. So don't Amway people. You know, don't bring them in and, and then sell them God. You know, bring them in and be their friend, because you have friends that need Jesus. You do. Think about the friends you have. Do you know if they're believers? Do you know? I bet some of them aren't. Barna, George Barna, did a survey once, and it said that 25% of the people, if you invite them, they would come to church. That's one in four of your friends. How many have more than four friends? Pittenger, you have more than four friends? Five? Okay. (laughs) So, he can invite one person. So, one in four of your friends. I have a lot of friends. I remember when I first got on Facebook, I'm going to tell my daughter, she's walking out. She was jealous of me because I had more friends than her on Facebook. I had like 500 friends on Facebook. And uh, so, okay, do the math because I'm not a math person. One in five, one in four. That's a lot of people, right, that I should be influencing for Christ. The next one is the invitational style. This one in the Bible is the Samaritan woman. Well, she had some things going against her. Number one, she was Samaritan. Number two, she was a woman. And number three, well, you know what the third one is, right? She was a, you know what she was. I said it three times in the first service, and I said I wasn't going to say that in the second service. (laughs) You know what she did, okay? You think she's a good minister? She was. 
after God touched her. He, shared, he talked to her. He convicted her. And he knew what she had done. And he told her. That'd be kind of scary, wouldn't it? Had some people, I preach over at Woodland Terrace, this little retirement center over by 71st Domingo. And I told these old people, uh, I, I tell them all the time. I, I call them something else besides old people. And uh, I said, when you were a kid, and probably even now, you do things that your mother never knew about. Are there things that you've done in your life that if your mother knew you did them, she'd roll over in her grave? And my mom's still alive. <laughs> yes? Is that a yes? Yeah. But you didn't tell her because you wanted to protect her, right? <laughs> yeah. I wanted to protect me, <laughs> is what I was protecting, yeah. But this woman was touched by God, changed by God, and she invited her friends to come hear him, and they became believers. People that hung out with her became believers. We probably need to do a better job in our churches about reaching out to people like that. Ugh. That'd get messy, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Be hard. But sh you're worth it. They're worth it to God. It says in verse 28 and 30, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And then they came out of the town and made their way toward him. You've got to tell people your story, your friends. You've got to tell them. Next one is the serving style. And this can be found in chapter 9 of the book of Acts. And the lady is Dorcas, not D-O-R-K, D-O-R-C-A-S. She was always doing good and helping the poor. She was well known for her loving acts of service, which she performed in the name of Christ. Specifically, she made robes and articles of clothing for widows and other needy people in her town. It was hard for people to miss this, this lady. She was a doer. Do we have doers here today? Yeah, we have a lot of doers in this church. How many have been... Uh, how many went with the guys to Arizona? I think that's where you went to help work on that reservation. Raise your hand if you're one of those guys. Any of them in here? How about if you went to Mexico? How many went to Ethiopia? How many make quilts? How many serve in some type of ministry in the church? Raise your hand. How many don't know? How many do a little thing that no one would ever know? Maybe you put out the bulletins out on the table. Whoop-dee-doo. I know you're, some people think that. But boy, if they're not there, someone thinks that. You're a servant. And guess what? Those people don't want to be recognized. I, I'm an elementary principal, and we have a volunteer luncheon. And we have tons of volunteers at my school. And about, I, I'd say we have over 100 volunteers. About 30 of them come to the Volunteer Appreciation Luncheon. You know why? Because people like that don't want to be recognized. They just want to do what they do and keep doing it. And guess what? Your service touches people. What you do touches people. So keep doing it, even though you think it's not any big deal. Keep being a server for God. Do you know that Dorcas, <clears throat> I love that word, Dorcas died prematurely. Did you know that? She was a worker. She did all these robes and stuff. She died early. And guess what Peter did? 
brought her back from the dead so she could keep working. Now that's ministry. <laughs> right? That's amazing. Once I'm dead, I'm dead. You're not bringing me back. Well, I hope he brings me back, but he probably won't. He probably won't. Amazing lady. But be careful. If you are a servant, don't give yourself the excuse that I can't share my faith. Because in Romans 10, 14, it says, how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? You are all ministers, whether you know it or not. And here's the last one, and it's not in the six. Pray. Pray, pray, pray. Because you have people in your circle of influence that you don't have the gift or the style that they need. Does that make sense? I mean, they need someone who's the confrontationalist, and that's not you. Or they need someone who's the friend type of person, and that's not you. So what you have to do is to pray and continue to pray. Let me give you an example of someone who benefited from prayer. My grandfather. He's deceased now. He lived to 96. He didn't want to live to 100 because nothing worked. That's what he told me. He said, you only got four years to live till you're 100. And he says, I don't want to live to be 100. I can't see. I can't hear. I can't taste anything. I can't drive. And he didn't. He didn't live to be 100. He lived to be 96 years old. But when he was 80 years old, let me back up an axe handle. I grew up in the church. went to Town & Country Christian Church up on North Garnett. I was raised in the church while my parents went to VBS, Wednesday night service, elders meetings. I went to all of them when I was a kid, everything. And, uh, but I knew my grandfather wasn't a believer. He was a great guy. He was a great guy. Everybody in Dewey, which is north of Bartlesville, knew him. He's a rancher, farmer, but he wasn't a believer. And I didn't know what to say. I mean, I'm just a little kid. I didn't know what to say, but I knew he didn't come to church. My grandmother did, but he didn't. Do you know someone like that? So I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. Then one Friday, I got a phone call from him, and he says, uh, I want you to come to church with me to, on Sunday. I go, really? I go, why? He was 83. He said, I'm going to be baptized Sunday. Any of you seen an 83-year-old guy be baptized? You, that, that's very rare. You think I went? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I went. And to see my grandfather at 83 start crying down in the water. Prayer is an important thing. But don't use that as an excuse. Got it? You need to pray when you're not the person. Because that's going to happen. You're not going to be the person in some situations. You're not. So, in closing, you like that of a preacher when he says in closing? There's my bald spot again. Thanks, Ryan. <clears throat> oh, Ryan, he reminded me of something. It's not you that does it. It's the Holy Spirit that lives in you that does it. Because believe it or not, I bet Greg Pittman, when he walks out of here after preaching, he goes, that was the worst sermon I've ever preached. But he'll get out in the hall and someone will say, your message really touched me. And you know what that is? That's the Holy Spirit. Okay? So it's not you. It's the Holy Spirit working in you to touch people. Thanks, Ryan, for reminding me about that. Ryan's the camera guy, the skinny one right there. 
on the camera. Wave your hand, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> so, you don't have an excuse to share your faith. You have to find the way that best suits you and them. And take a look at your relationship with God. Because if you're one of those lukewarmers, God would probably say, you need to back up a little bit. You wait until you're a little warmer before you start. Because they're going to see inconsistencies in your walk. Now, that's not an excuse either to stay inconsistent. That's a call for you to get off your and go the hot way, okay? And lastly, quit making excuses for not sharing your faith with people and being friends with people and caring about people. And they're your friends. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time we've been able to look into your word and Father, just looking to see that we don't have an excuse for not sharing you and the gift of you to those friends around us. Father, help us to be good listeners of our friends when the time is right to share our faith. Help us to be open to your call as we leave today. Let us all think, okay, which one of those styles is me? But more importantly, which one of those styles is will my friend receive the best? Move us, Father, with your Holy Spirit.